And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Richard Marshall. Uh, Rich has spoken at CornCon a couple times previously and uh, just really happy to have him back uh, to, to speak. So, uh, and Rich is sticking around so you can catch him afterwards. Um, if you need Q&A, Rich, we have a mic down here. So I'll just let you uh, start your slide presentation. Thank you. All right, don't feel that you got to wait until I finish my, quote, presentation to ask questions. I usually deliver my comments in a seminar style and walk around, and, but because of the uh, limitations associated with COVID, I guess I'm relegated to... You can have this mic. Well, I'm, I'm up here now, so. Just get the mic a little closer. I have to hold it. No, no, just Oh, okay. Well, I'll try to lean into the mic. Is that better? All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to say a few things that are controversial. And uh, I may upset some of you in the audience, or I may upset some of your friends or some of your business colleagues but I have a tendency to tell it like it is. And then I'll go through some other practical uh, commentary uh, that you might find, hopefully that you'll find useful. So let's, uh, explain 
what the difference is. Left of boom is what you do to prevent a problem. Right of boom is what you do to correct the mistakes that have happened. So I want to talk a little bit about left of boom. Now, in order to get there, I want to kind of set some things up. My major job is to run a billion dollar company in the Middle East called Centurion. We're putting in a new fiber optic cable system from Europe through nine countries in Saudi Arabia, it concludes Saudi Arabia, going to Pakistan, India, and Singapore. Never been done. Most of the people in this region did not get along until recently. But I'm really proud to say that I've got Saudis on my board and Israelis on my board, and one of my business partners is Israeli. And they get along. They talk to each other pleasantly. That's progress. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is not to talk about Centurion, but to emphasize the fact that the whole world is connected with undersea cables. Undersea cables are not new. The first undersea cable was laid in 1855. Now, it wasn't fiber optic, it was telegraph. But the point I want to make is that we are all connected around the world, much closer than we ever have been. Instantaneously, our adversaries can reach us. And instantaneously, they do. And that's something that we have to deal with over and over and over again. It's not just somebody that's a close hacker. They are attacking us from everywhere there's electricity. And part of the reason they can do that is not just because of the massive telecommunication links that we enjoy today, but we've also been the author of our own misery. And here's what I mean by that. The cybersecurity industry, and I'm going to back off a little bit and using that term, I'm just going to focus on the software industry. Those who make software formally and currently are a protected entity. They beta test customers. We're the customers, they beta test us. Because the software they put out to market is not foolproof, it's not bulletproof. And as an emphasis of that, every first Tuesday of every month, a major software developer by the name of Microsoft, to their credit, puts out a list of vulnerabilities that need to be corrected. Now, that's a wonderful step forward, but it's not enough. Because most of the entities that get that list of vulnerabilities to check and correct, as Richard said earlier, the other Richard I've said earlier today, don't do it. They don't do it because it's time consuming, it's expensive, and they're really not sure how the patches interact with their systems that they currently are running. And this is particularly true of the financial services sector. They're not sure until they run a series of tests that the vulnerabilities that have been identified to be corrected, that the source code that Microsoft provides will correct it without disrupting their current system. And the other factor is just basic economics. The financial services sector is in business, shockingly enough, to make money. And if it's cheaper to absorb an attack rather than take precautionary measures to prevent the attack, guess which wins? The bean counter. And that's one of the reasons I advocate never let a CFO be your CEO. They're too worried about money rather than trying to get the job done effectively. A related issue, monoculture. Most entities in the world use Microsoft. Now, I'm not an anti-Microsoft individual. A lot of places use Oracle. Uh, I use Microsoft, I use Oracle and I'm a big Mac user as well. But the problem is Microsoft is so embedded in China and Russia and other countries that we won't mention, but those are the two primary ones, 
they know Microsoft better than we do because they have a lot of people that are very, very smart. They spend a lot of time trying to break in and modify and hack Microsoft, and they return that to us when they hack us. We need to change that. The only way we're going to change that protected industry, two ways. One is legislation. And we have to remember we have the best Congress representatives that money can buy. <laughs> and a lot of the money that buys them comes from the Northwest. Uh, read into that Microsoft if you want to. And I'm not being disparaging of Microsoft, I'm just pointing out a reality. Congress is not interested in changing this issue because they are not directly affected and it would disrupt their pay schedule, so to speak. Now, let's go back to, and this is particularly true of Iowa, the Midwest flyover country. When locomotives first came out and were going across the United States, those locomotives would spew fire and it would set the wheat fields on fire and set the cornfields on fire. The farmers were pissed, but there wasn't a damn thing they could do about it because the railroad industry was protected, protected by Congress, protected by business interests. They did not want to disrupt that. Too bad, farmer, so you lost your crop. BFD, we really don't care. Now, after a period of time, enough people got upset with that and took away the protections that the railroad industry had about spewing fire and setting fields on fire. Legislation is one way to accomplish it, but I don't hold out a lot of confidence that that will occur. Now, the other thing I should share with you, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a recovering attorney. I'm in favor of the Lawyer Full Employment Act. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about now is litigation, mass litigation against Microsoft and Oracle and others, and, and the small developers too. They're just as bad. It will take class actions to get them to change their act. Now you think that's impossible? Let's look at car safety. Anybody remember McPherson v. Buick? No. You've never heard of it until today. But that was a landmark case that said you have privity of contract, meaning you can sue a manufacturer of an automobile if it's defective. Now, if software is defective, why can't you sue them? Part of the reason you can't sue them is because they're a protected industry. How do we know they're a protected industry? How many of you read the shrink wrap? The shrink wrap license basically says, you are getting to use this product that you're paying for as is. If there are defects, tough timber toes, it is your problem, not mine. And we're happy with that because we're so accustomed to it and we feel powerless to do something about it. I'm advocating let's get rid of that protective legislation. Let's do some litigation. Let's change that system. Now, all of that is for my friend Ira, which has left the boom. Let's talk about the issues that we need to deal with now. What is our objective? The right of them. That's to keep the hackers out of our system. How well are we doing it? Uh, this is for cat lovers. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating. It's awesome. But we just don't do enough. You know, I mentioned earlier, Microsoft issuing patches. Well, Patch Tuesday's a wonderful holiday but it's followed by an even bigger holiday called uh, Vulnerability Wednesday, Hacker Wednesday. All right, this is a depiction of where all the nodes are that can attack us. Where there's light, there is a capability to come in and attack us because the communications network that we enjoy today is so much more extensive than we had five years ago, 10 years ago. It's pervasive. Hackers are always on the lookout to take advantage of even your smallest little imperfection. They have the time, the skill, and the drive to know the inside of your system better than you do. And 
I, I, I don't mean to pick on CISOs, but all too often, because of lack of time and because of lack of resources, our motto is TLAR. That looks about right. Nobody's going to notice that minor imperfection, and we'll just continue to monitor the system and hope nothing happens. Well, the bad guys don't follow that logic, and the bad ladies don't follow that logic. They look for everything and try to figure out your system better than you can possibly figure it out, because they have the time and they have the motivation. It doesn't, it costs more to protect than it does to attack. Basic rule. And they spend a lot of time and intellectual energy in finding that little hole that little password, that little connection to take advantage. You know, what we don't always understand is we have protected our system, but those that we are connected to, have they protected their system? And those that we've connected to, whether we don't know whether or not they protected their systems, who are they connected to and how they protected their systems? You see, it's an endless worry. Uh, most of you probably are sophisticated in this audience, and I don't need to go through how an exploit unfolds in stages. Uh, you can just look at a copy of this and I'm sure figure it out. If anybody got a question on it, we'll try to answer it. But I think this pretty much says it for itself. Exploits unfold in stages. I love this particular diagram. Uh, my son put this together, by the way. Uh, I started taking him to Black Hat and DEF CON many years ago when he was in his early 20s and he really enjoyed it uh, being there and I enjoyed having him around, uh, giving him something to do, a uh, nice distraction. And he got to meet a lot of fascinating people because he worked as a goon and uh, escorted a lot around. So this slide uh, explains how it unfolds in stages, a visual demonstration. We don't ever want to see this. That means you've been had too bad. Be alert for other techniques, fishing scams, water holes. The adversary is very good about exploiting that. And they will come after your CEO, who no matter how smart they are in terms of business, is really devoid of security practices. And they'll say, hey, Joe, CEO, here is a great article that you need to read. And they click on it. And when they click on it, they download bad code. They download an attack. <laughs> and you get blamed for it as a CISO. That's not really fair, but that's just the, the reality. So be very careful about downloading anything from an email address that you're not comfortable with. Uh, my brother's a good uh, example of this. If I send him an email that I don't, I've got five email addresses. If I don't use the same email address with every email I send to him, he won't open it. That's how paranoid he is. And I try to explain to him, I said, look, I have these five email addresses. He said, I'm only gonna use one. If you want me to read it, send it on this particular address, otherwise I'm going to ignore it. Now, that's a good practice, a, a, a little extreme perhaps, but nobody's hacked the system. So I guess that works. Uh, most of the attacks that come after you are tailored. Uh, it's not one size fits all anymore. They spend a lot of time designing an attack just for you. They're not interested in Joe and Bob and Phil. They're interested in only you. Now that's a sign of adoration that I don't particularly appreciate. But you need to keep that in mind. And as I've told many CEOs who've asked, why should I care? And I tell them two things. Number one, because they always respond, this is a technical issue. I don't need to know that. That's blowing to the propeller heads. And I said, yes, they implement. But this is a leadership issue. You're supposed to be the leaders of your company. You're supposed to make sure that people who are responsible for protecting you have the available resources. And then I get a wise ass comment from the CEO who says, well, gosh, that's kind of like paying, paying for burial insurance and not dying. Well, I, I don't see the logic in that, but I see a lot of humor in that. 
But when you talk to the CEOs and talk to the leadership group around the table, make sure they understand this is a leadership issue. It's part of their responsibility. It doesn't just fall on the cyber folks in your, on your, in your team. And also help them realize that it's not just you that are vulnerable, but everyone that you're connected to. Not everyone has protected their systems as well as you have. No vulnerability is too insignificant to exploit. Anything and everything is fair game to these folks. And they spend a lot of time, a lot of energy going after even the smallest little glitch in your system. So when you do a penetration test and you say, well, most of the holes are corrected, but that's not good enough. Spend the extra time to make sure all of the vulnerabilities are corrected, not just the ones that are more visible, not just the ones that are easier to correct. Make their job harder. Make your job safer. Patching is critical. We tend to ignore that because it's too hard sometimes. We tend to ignore training everyone who's on the computer about computer safety, computer security. And it's particularly become a great problem post-COVID. Why? Because so many of us are working from home. So many of us are working on our man-made disaster model, portable devices. Now what we fail to realize is that when you're working in your office, you're in a, a protected enclave because you've got a special team of technologists that help protect that environment. But when you're operating from home, how many of you think your home environment is as safe as your office environment? I'm glad nobody raised their hands. Because in the home, everyone uses the same system. Your kids, mine are grown, so I don't have to worry about that. But I do have to worry about my neighbor who steals my Wi-Fi occasionally, because he has kids. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But we need to be extra special and careful about working from home and knowing who we're connected to. At home, I'm sure you get more emails addressed to your home system than you did at the office addressed to your office email system. And that just opens up a great window of vulnerability for the hackers to come in. No matter how strong your defensive mechanisms are, there's always somebody that has a way of finding out how to do it. get this to work, it'll be fascinating. I think this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all. That's a good one for your CFO. All right, let's go through some other stuff. We have a little bit more time. I don't want to interfere with Mike's presentation.
that does not work. You need to be resilient. You need to be strong. You need to know what you're doing and how to do it. And I'm hoping that you have developed the confidence to do that. Now, part of it is having a perception. How many of you look at this picture and imagine it is the ocean? It's nobody? Yeah. That's the reaction I get from most people. I mean, it's not a rhetorical question. They say, my gosh, why would anybody want to drive in the water? Well, the issue is this is not water. This is the desert. So be mindful of the perceptions that you're dealing with on the internet. Not everything looks like what it is. Your system to you is going to look complicated. And to the adversary, it may look complicated, but they're gonna get involved and inside so much that they know your system better than you do. And it's gonna look like, oh yeah, you're protected. But look at that big hole you left me to come in and visit you. It's not as complicated as we like to think it is. We can address that issue. We can look out for the bad guys. I mean, no, notice in the middle, there's a little sailboat that doesn't seem to be bothered at all by that big iceberg, that big threat. They're ignoring it. The last thing we need to do is to ignore a known threat or a developing threat. It's not all calm seas. It's not all beautiful. It's not a scenic route that we're on trying to protect our systems. Here's what we have to be careful of. We have this little boat in the middle of the ocean and look at the threat underneath it. And they are completely oblivious. <coughs> if I were in that boat, I'd be paddling like hell to get away from that whale. We need to do the same thing and avoid adversaries. It's not that complicated. There is a path, we can follow it. Right and true. We don't need to be confused and think it's too tough for us to do. We can do it. And know who you're... I, I, I like this slide because it suggests know who you're sleeping with, but that's not the topic of my point. No. But know who you're hanging out with. Know who you're connected with. Even though they look different, even though they are different, you need to understand whether you can, have, can afford to have a trusted relationship with them. Otherwise, you're gonna wind up connected to everybody that you, and you have no idea who they are or what their protective systems are. And that's gonna kind of make you vulnerable. You may think you've got a clear path to success. And while you're basking in the highlight and the sunlight of success, you fail to notice the impediments in the middle of the road, the hackers that are coming out down at the bottom. I hope all of you saw that. Most people comment, it's like, wow, that's a beautiful picture. You want to be happy and know that you have succeeded in protecting your system. Find the proper way for people to communicate. It's complicated, but you're talented enough to do that and help them get through the thicket of the danger that they're exposed to on the internet. You're not alone doing this. You may feel that you're out on a precipice. You're all alone but you're not, you have support. And one of the points that Richard made that I'm going to make again too, um, join organizations that can help you personally and professionally. Now I'm part of, one of my part-time jobs as the general counsel of ISSA. I am not here to tell you to join ISSA. ISSA did not sponsor this event, so I'm not proselyting for ISSA. But there are, organizations like them that you should really consider joining uh, so that you're not all alone in trying to solve this problem. You may think you're protected, but you, there's always a vulnerability that you've overlooked. Here's part of the problem too. You have so many vendors that promise you the solution. Buy me and I'll set you free. Buy my stuff and you're good enough. I'm raising the bulls here fly on that. Constantly. Here's what you need to do. I really like your product. It is awesome. Are you willing to stand behind it? Oh yeah. Yeah, this is not puffery. This is a real thing. Great. We'll buy your product. 
but I want in writing a guarantee that if your product fails, you're going to pay the damage that resulted from your defective product. Now, if you're selling a product, are you willing to sign that document? I doubt it. But if we put some pressure on the vendors, maybe they will do a better job at providing safer products. You go to RSA, you go to Black Hat, you go to DEF CON, you, you go to the vendors. They all say the same damn thing. It's like they had a text to remember that particular week. They all sound alike, but none of them can really deliver what we really need. The other thing you need to worry about is your dashboard. Don't have so many products that you need to monitor to see what's going on that you just get utterly confused and don't know which one to pay attention to. Always look for the secret way. Some of them are tried and true. Some of them are a little rocky. Some are nice and clean. I advocate the nice and clean. Don't get stuck alone. <laughs> help is there for you. You need to help your clients, help your team get through the maze of cybersecurity. The lion and the tiger may be more powerful, but the wolf does not perform in a circus. And I'm encouraging you to be a wolf. We've seen that in your presentation yesterday. Very dynamic. I like that approach. Fear has two meanings, to get everything and run. All too often people do that. But I prefer face everything and rise. That's what we need to do individually and collectively. Whatever you do today, do it with the confidence of a four-year-old wearing a Batman shirt. <laughs> Have hustle. Get out there and kick ass and take names. This is what you want to look like at the end of the day. You may have been riddled, but you're still standing. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any questions from the audience or comments? Oh. Off the internet. <laughs> Look, I, I'm so paranoid. I have three detection systems on my home environment. Uh, and my son says, Dad, that's wrong. They conflict with each other. And I said, yeah, they probably do. But I haven't been hacked. <laughs> so I, I feel that I'm doing the right thing. Now, I'm speaking ahead of time when I say I haven't been hacked. A lot of the pictures I was able to find was through my connections on Facebook. Well, I'm in Facebook hell. Uh, Facebook has decided that I'm not worthy. Are you kidding? I'm not kidding. Well, why are you happy? I'm not happy. I can't believe it. Well, I wrote them and said WTFO, and they just said FO, so that was it. <laughs> that's what I got, too. Yeah, crazy. Well, that's not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I love you on Facebook. I know. Yeah. Do you have Yes, I do. Can you talk about this, uh, the, the, the big uh, software company somewhere else, what I call the legal click of your, all your rights go away forever, because that's what they hide in. Is there a way around that? I mean, every person that's not all technology, you know, you get 10 pages of number four font, click, now you get to use it. How do we ever get around that legally and contractual law? Just solve that problem, please. Well, let me borrow a page from my past that, that might be beneficial. I'll close my eyes, but I'll ask for those of you who have a relationship with your counsel to raise your hand. One, two, two and a half. Well, you're different, you're special. <laughs> As we'll find out when he gives his presentation. One of the key people on your team and make them part of your team is your lawyer. Help your lawyer understand what you're trying to do. Educate them. When I was at NSA, as, as uh, the, the senior lawyer for InfoSec, we had a group of people that were testing defense communication systems for efficacy. Basically, they were hacking. And I was shocked. I said, God damn it, you do that, that's a felony. 
it's really very disruptive. And they said, well, it's necessary that we test these systems. I he said, yes, help me understand what you're doing so I don't have to be a witness or go visit you in jail. And so they took me into a group um, and turned me into a hacker. Now, I wasn't all that good, but I understood what they were trying to do and to an extent how they could do it. I got into their mindset. And that helped me a lot understanding what they were trying to do. So then I took it on as an objective. How can I figure out a way for these guys and gals to do this legally? And so I looked at a governing director for NSA that said, we're authorized to test communication systems. Well, we'll be. That helps. But what about other communication systems that are related to those? And so I looked at uh, the USC 1048, I think was the name, number of it, 1018, which is a criminal statute. If you violate it, it's a felony if you're convicted. But there was a provision in there that says the owner of the system can permit you to come in and test this system. Well, the conundrum was who is the owner of the DOD systems? And I figured, what the hell, let's go to the top, let's go to SecDef. So I had to brief the Secretary of Defense General Counsel, who hated NSA. And I had to help her understand that we were not the nasty SIGIN organization. We were there to protect communications, which was a lot of fun and fascinating. She said, well, Rich, that sounds very good. I think you need to go and talk to the Attorney General and brief her. Yes, ma'am, I said. I'll set up a meeting for us to go next week. She said, oh, no, you go by yourself. Now, when a leader tells you to go by yourself, alert. There's a message there. Because in Washington, success has a thousand fathers, and failure is born illegitimate. So here I was, all by my lonesome, going to meet the Attorney General, Janet Reno. Janet Reno is about this tall, or was. She's dead now, unfortunately. She had a little bit of a, a shape, cerebral palsy or something. Fascinating woman, and I was, she was a brilliant lawyer. I, I was somewhat intimidated and apprehensive about meeting her because in her college days, she made tuition by wrestling alligators. Now, if you have successfully wrestled alligators you're, and still alive, you must be pretty damn formal. But she was absolutely amazing. She said, Rich, this is a wonderful idea, let's do it. And that led to uh, eligible receiver 97, which maybe one or two of you've heard of. And that's where we took a group of people, less than 20, and took down the DOD communication system in a test. It was an amazing achievement. And that sent a signal to the President of the United States, who said, we need to protect our critical infrastructure. So it's important to have a good relationship with your lawyer to help them understand what you're doing and how best to do it legally. Make them your ally rather than your enemy, like you do. What? <laughs> I'm working with you. Okay. All right, any other questions? I'll be around for the rest of the day. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm just curious about Can you use a microphone? My hearing aids don't work that far. I just want to know if you can give me one of your five email addresses so I can see how secure you are. Talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Okay. Speak slower, please. Okay. I would like to know one of your five email addresses so I can see how safe you are. <laughs> 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 I'm willing to do that with a non-disclosure agreement. I'll send you one right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm just as interested in, in the results as you are. <laughs> but I have to protect my assets. No pun intended. Okay. Good question, by the way. I should have realized that's something you would ask. Okay. Uh, ready for Michael? Yes, sir. 
th this may be off the subject, but uh, I wonder if people in China have the same problem we have here. And I know China has their social credit system where they evaluate uh, all their citizens. So it's, in theory, easy to make a relationship, you know, whether the person is low or high on the citizenship. Do you see that, it, that type of approach expanding to different countries? Yes. I'm a victim of it here in the United States. I'm convinced that I'm a victim of that social standing thing here in the United States. I'm convinced that uh, Facebook saw something that they didn't like and decided to shut me down with no notice. When I complained, they said, you can file a complaint, we'll look at it, and then we'll decide whether we say yes or no. If we decide no, your system is eliminated completely. My system has been completely eliminated. You know, eight, eight years of good stuff on Facebook. I thought I had a good relationship, but they decided no. I mean, no due process, nothing legitimate. So yes, we have a problem here in this country, and I don't want to get into the politics of it on this stage. I'll do it privately with you. You may not like what I have to say, but we are rapidly approaching. Some entities in the United States are rapidly approaching that type of system that the Chinese have developed. And remember too, the Chinese are using U.S. technology to do this. And they didn't buy it, they stole it. I love the Chinese people, I just don't like the Chinese government. All right, all right, Michael, come up and save me. Okay. <laughs>